Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to Ernie Hebert Day. Thank you. It's very kind. My name is Jack Cohen. I'm a volunteer at the Keene Public Library. I would like to acknowledge some people who helped promote this event. Sean Patrick from station WYRY and Dan Mitchell from station WKVK. Both gentlemen donated airtime to promote this event and my, my thanks for their generosity. I want to talk briefly about why Ernie Hebert Day is appropriate for the Keene Public Library Building Common Grounds program. I have to start 20 years ago when I first heard of Ernie Hebert. I heard about Ernie Hebert 20 years before I met him. Maybe you could say I met him in stages. If an author's in his books, then I met him in stages. The final stage being the actual physical meeting after 20 years. After I heard of him, I read The Dogs of March and admired his story of real people with real emotions and thought that's what I want to do. I want to write about real people in real places. I read two or three more of his books, and each time I learned more about Ernie Hebert. Ernie took the materials that he grew up with and fashioned them into art. Ernie took common ground and sublimated it to literature. Those of you who've read Never Back Down or Dogs of March know what I'm talking about. I thought there was no greater skill than to be able to do that. William Faulkner said, a man with real ability finds sufficient what he has at hand. That was certainly true of Ernie. I could prove it. I'd seen Howard Elman at gas stations and convenience stores. 20 years went by and I met Ernie Hebert. I was in for a whole nother revelation. What I came to discover is that Ernie Hebert is not only a talented writer, but what makes him special is he's a kind and generous man. Ernest Hebert Day in Keene is deserved and in keeping with what is the most noble of which we are capable. This is a man who went from driving a cab in Keene to the faculty of Dartmouth College. Remember, a man with real ability finds sufficient what he has at hand. And remember too, all the while, never losing his compassion for others. I hope you will join with me in celebrating Ernie, man and writer. Terry Pendell and Ernie met each other at the Crossroads Apartment in Swansea in 1971. Ernie enlisted Terry as a reader for his works in progress, and the two men would sit up late into the night having a se seminar discussing writing, literature, and philosophy. Terry is a former teacher and department head at Keene High School, a Keene city councilor, and the author of three books about rail travel in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and a fourth book, A Good Place to Live, America's Last Migration. Terry and Ernie have been good friends for 40 years. I'm excited to be able to present to you Terry Pindell. Thank you, Jack. You have done a great job. <laughs> Ernie is so well known around these parts and beyond he does not shy from putting himself out there for the world to see. He has legions of friends like us and readers who spread the word about his work and his life. He has put Cheshire County and the only somewhat fictional Darby, it is really Westland, on the literary map. A week or two ago, he came to me and wondered whether we should really go through with this event today since he felt he may have had too much exposure so wondering what I should say about my oldest New Hampshire friend here, I thought I should come up with things not well known to the world at large. First thing I came up with is the fact that Ernie has a really quirky mind. That's not a secret. Quirky with his sometimes off-kilter love of words and playing with them, sometimes to the point of weirdness. This is a guy who once wrote a poem, Ernie does write beautiful poetry, in which he was so proud that he had found a way to rhyme Nazarene with gasoline. <laughs> More persistent has been his sometimes annoying punny. Ernie can make a pun out of anything. In a conversation this summer, the name of some painkillers, oxycodones, came up. Immediately, they became oxycondones and stayed that way. 
I'll stop with that one example. Maybe I should have stopped there. <laughs> Ernie has done so much punning in his drafts that I and other readers really got on his case for a while. You can't have authorial or narrative voice doing all these stupid puns, we all said. So Ernie responded by writing a book with one character afflicted by some neurological condition that provoked him to blurt puns, almost like some version of Tourette's syndrome. <laughs> Since the character was the only voice in the book who did this, it worked for us readers. Who says authors don't model characters on themselves? I've done a lot of fishing with Ernie, which leads perhaps to the worst piece of Ernie quirkiness to us true New Hampshire trout and bass loving fishermen. His insistence that the only fish worth catching and cooking and eating is the small yellow perch. Ernie actually published a piece about New Hampshire fish that ended with that abominable state. But I come to praise Ernie, not to roast him. <laughs> we know that Ernie's work constitutes a great piece of Americana and will be recognized as such. More on that shortly. But back to my original theme about what many might not know. Ernie, in his conversation, emails, essays, keeps many of our brains working at top pitch. He and I recently had an interchange about his work in progress lecture about the great Gatsby demeaning working people. His point was that by focusing on and exalting the idle rich, Fitzgerald ignored the working man and therefore the book should not be considered, as it has been recently, a good candidate for the great American novel. We thought the great American novel in this supposedly minimally class-based society should write across the classes, the way Thomas Hardy did in England. This led us to a preliminary conclusion that supposedly class-free America perhaps generated fewer cross-class writers than did class-obsessed England. We had a really hard time finding an American writer who crossed class like Hardy, maybe Herman Melville. There was much more to this, but what I have said is enough to show that Ernie's active, smart brain has always stimulated the brains of his friends all the way back to the popcorn and beer nights at the crossroads. And the energy ignited by Ernie's spark spreads. My wife, Diane Champion, and I have continued this discussion, wondering if books like To Kill a Mockingbird might be candidates for great American novel. An ongoing conversation Sometimes a debate that I have had with Ernie for 40 years has been, what is the source of domestic strife worldwide? Ernie says, class. I have always said, clan. Class versus clan. The Ernie and Terry debate forever. Ernie will say that all internal domestic conflict is about the struggle between classes. I always argue that it's about clan, and by that I mean not just family and race, but ethnicity and gender. Of course, we both agree that the other is right in many instances. In fact, that's part of the fun. We're both right. We find crossovers where class and clan are interlinked. This is a debate that does not need to be won. It doesn't matter. The point is the intellectual exercise and just plain fun that are staked out positions in gender. Though I must say, despite the obvious interest in class in Ernie's books, I think there is an equal interest in claim. I mean, what is the Jordan kinship? I have in my possession manuscripts of Hebert novels the world has not seen, and in some cases a good thing. I imagine sometimes that after his death, if I outlive him, when he is properly canonized, they might make me rich. There is a sci-fi novel written when Ernie had first learned about spin labels of subatomic particles with two main characters, here come puns, Professors Wan Up and Wan Down. I should probably burn this one, since it was before he went to Breadloaf and learned to write one good sentence at a time with John Gardner. There is another 
unpublished novel about a cross-country fire starter who eventually tries to burn down Mount Monadnock. <laughs> this also turns out to be another Darby novel, but I may be giving away the ending here. I think this is actually one of Ernie's most dramatic novels, unpublished, and should be his movie book. But the published work is enough to show that he will find his place in the American literary canon. Some of the books are already taught in schools and colleges. We did that when I taught literature at Keene High School. Our students read, marveled, and felt proud. I can't think of anyone since Faulkner with his Yoke Napatalfa County books who has created such an immediate, ongoing American world as Ernie has with the Darby books. I'm sorry, Ern, I know you hate that comparison. It's not the authors, it's the two worlds I'm comparing. And what people sometimes forget is that it's not all Darby. A little more than kin is Greek, the Oedipus story. In others, we find Nordic myth, Roman myth, original American myth, and of course, echoes of Shakespeare. These books are learning. And beyond Darby, the old American stands out as one of the best historical fictions I have ever read. Read that book and muse on the study and research it took to create that colonial and Native American world so far away. I do remember Ernie spending a year poking into the arcana of eating utensils, household possessions, Native American gear from the time period. I thought he was obsessed, but he knew what he was doing. That may be something else most people don't know. I think it's something Ernie doesn't even know. With his work, Ernie always turns out to know what he has been doing, even when the rest of us don't get it. In the past few years, he has had me befuddled with his interest in computers and their capabilities, computer-generated art, which, by the way, he does so well that he should have a gallery right beside his wife's photography, artificial intelligence, games that simulate life or the story, as in his most recent Darby book. He can drive me crazy with this stuff as he talks about chips replicating our brains to lead to some kind of immortality. But it doesn't matter that this stuff blows my mind. He's working on something. He's leading to something. There's going to be a book whose premise is far from Darby. Here's where the quirkiness I started with becomes feckant. People believe that Ernie tells great stories, and he does. But I want to end with a short reading that shows the skill and intelligence in the sentences he can write from the aforementioned essay about New Hampshire fish. As fly fishermen are wont to say, especially when holding forth before non-fly fishermen, the brook trout is not a true char trout, but a char, a northern climb fish, primitive, narrow-minded, vulnerable to change, the only thing that saves it from being just another boring conservative is its beauty and fighting spirit. Unfortunately, it's not so smart. It responds to a worm like a liberal to a new idea. So there you have it. The Darby native brook trout is a mixed metaphor. I mean, really. <laughs> His most recent collaboration with Burns is The Dust Bowl, which premieres on PBS in November and will be accompanied by a book of the same name which Duncan wrote. It is my honor to introduce to you Mr. Dayton Duncan. Thank you, Jack, and thank you for putting this on. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be here on Ernie Hebert Day. Um, it's great to have Midori here, for whom uh, the last 40 plus years, every day has been Ernie Hebert Day. <laughs> At least in Ernie's mind, I think. And uh, like Terry, I have a, a number of uh, those unpublished novels, and so there'll be competition uh, when we start to put them on eBay uh, at, at some point. And like Terry, I've been in debates with Ernie for 41 years now. 
The difference being is I've won every single one of them. <laughs> uh, I think it's fitting for Keen to honor Ernie because he is one of Keen's great success stories. A kid who grew up on the east side, the son of a man who worked in the mills all his life and a mother who was a nurse. A kid who spoke French until he started school. A boy who was told that college was not in his future, who then went into the army and served his country, went to work for the telephone company, and then fired with this intense desire for a better education, finally persuaded King State to accept him. And after they very reluctantly did, became an honor student who ultimately went on to postgraduate work at the famous Stanford Writing School, then to the Keen Sentinel, the Boston Globe, and the author of many critically acclaimed novels, then a teacher at Keen State itself, and now a tenured professor at an elite Ivy League school, Dartmouth, where he is teaching the next generation of America's writers, putting his own stamp on the literature of our future. So it's very fitting to have Ernie, De Ernie Hebert Day here in Keene. In fact, it's impossible to think of Ernie and not think of Keene. Not just where he was born, spent so much of his life. His remarkable novels demonstrate again and again that although he's worked and lived and traveled to many other places, Ernie never really left Keene. It's part of his blood, it's part of his soul, and it's part of his art. I first met him 41 years ago in the early summer of 1971. I had just graduated from college and moved to Keene, and he had just returned to his hometown after studying at Stanford. I was putting my Ivy League education to work at Elliott Community Hospital, unloading trucks and stocking shelves. <laughs> he was putting his advanced studies to work by manning the pumps at Top Gas on Winchester Street. I guess, I guess our friendship developed partly out of our shared curiosity about the world, the excitement of ideas, as Terry talked about, and the fierce thirst to absorb as much of life as we could. That, and the fact that neither of us saw our future in continuing what we were doing at that moment. He wanted to be a poet or a novelist, and at the time I dreamed of going to graduate school and becoming a college professor. As it turned out, I never went to graduate school, and he's the one who became a professor. Something I probably should have realized at the start because I have learned so much under his example and his friendship. He, more than anyone else, made me into a New Hampshire person, a proud resident of the Monadnock region. He was and is so deeply rooted here and he nurtured the transplanting of my own roots into this rocky soil so different from my native Iowa. After he got a job as a sports reporter for the Keene Sentinel, Ernie's the one who turned me away from graduate school to reporting. He persuaded the Sentinel to hire me as a sports stringer, and in a single car ride, taught me the very basics of writing a news story. It's a mystery novel, he explained, that begins with, the butler did it. That's the news, you know, the inverse pyramid of uh, what you then learn uh, is the inverse pyramid. Get to the news first. Introducing me, well, as it turns out, I was actually his first writing student. Um, and uh, that's so long ago that I had hair when he was teaching me these things. Introducing me to reporting and writing changed the entire direction of my life putting me on the course that led me to writing not just newspaper stories, but ultimately books and documentary films. And for that, I will always be grateful. We've had lots of adventures together over those 41 years. We snowshoed from Nelson to Stoddard. A long struggle made even more of a struggle when halfway there, some people swished easily past on cross-country skis, and we wondered, why don't we have those? <laughs> We've unfurled a sheet and held it between us to skate easily across a frozen granite lake. 
We've helped each other attempt to keep our houses warm with the wood we've cut, usually managing somehow to hang up the trees we're trying to fell or getting our, our saws stuck when the tree tipped in the opposite direction we had planned. He once watched me, stupidly, toss gasoline on a brush pile we were burning, nearly turning myself into a human torch. When Ernie and I get together, the collective IQ drops about 15 <laughs> points. We pursued a moose that was wandering through Keene so Ernie could write uh, what turned out to be a prize-winning story for the Sentinel. We once engaged in what became, to us at least, an epic canoe trip on a tributary of the mighty Ashwila from the airport to the covered bridge in Swansea. <laughs> Probably a total of a mile or maybe two but with so many turns and oxbows and confusion in the pucker brush, it took us all day and by the end, as the sun was setting, we were panicked that we would never see our wives again <laughs> and seemed to us as if we were Lewis and Clark. We've driven across the entire continent from San Francisco to Keene, so engrossed in discussions about everything from the landscape to philosophy that we never turned on the radio. Can you become naive? That was just one of the conundrums we came up with. <laughs> chewed, chewed on through, I think, all of Nebraska. In our travels and adventures, one thing I've learned about Ernie is that no one, 